Thank you. It's a tremendous honor to be here and to take part in this remarkable event. And it's a special pleasure to be back in Brisbane again. Um, I've visited Brisbane many times through my youth and childhood, and it's lovely to be here again. My topic is the authority of hate speech. And you might think that's a peculiar topic, because if anything lacks authority, surely it's hate speech. But I want to bring authority down to earth and argue that certain forms of hate speech can have authority, and this makes a difference to what hate speech can do. I'm going to ask about what hate speech is. I'm going to argue that it's got nothing to do with offense and nothing to do with the expression of ideas. I'm going to ask what difference authority makes to hate speech and where that authority might come from. And finally, since we are supposed to be uh, looking into causes for optimism, I'm going to ask about what, if anything, could be done about it. I'll begin with some examples. The examples, as is inevitable, are going to be horrible, so uh, brace yourselves. In uh, 1938, Sturmer Verlag, which was a Nazi uh, publisher, uh, published a series of publications, some of which were directed at children. One was a story called Der Giftpilz, or The Poisonous Mushroom. Uh, just as it's often hard to tell a toadstool from an edible mushroom, so too it is often very hard to recognize the Jew as a swindler and a criminal. That was the caption under the title story with an image of a mother with a little boy looking in the forest for uh, mushrooms. And the point of the book, as with the point of many of the uh, series of children's books that Sturmer Verlag published, was to get across the message that uh, Jewish, people, Jewish people looked just like everybody else, but they were poisonous just like the toadstool. So, I want to draw out one thing about that. One is that coming from a publication that had Nazi support gave it a kind of authority that it would not otherwise have had. And secondly, it deprived Jewish people of authority by making them uh, hard to believe. In fact, impossible to believe. We're familiar with the story of the boy who cried wolf. We don't think often enough about how uh, some people can destroy the credibility, not just of themselves, but of other people, and that that can involve a kind of silencing. That kind of speech comes under the heading of propaganda, which is one kind of hate speech. Indeed, propaganda is the main kind of hate speech described in the UN uh, Convention, the 1965 UN Convention, uh, against the, uh, for the elimination of forms of racial discrimination. Uh, it says that uh, we need to uh, condemn all propaganda and all organizations which are based on ideas or theories of superiority of one race or group of persons of one color or ethnic origin, or which attempt to justify or promote racial hatred and discrimination. So one idea, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but one idea about hate speech is that it is a certain kind of uh, propaganda, uh, which... Um, aims to promote hatred, but also does other things too. I'll look at what those other things might be in just a second. A different picture of hate speech uh, focuses on hate speech as a kind of assault. So Mari Matsuda, uh, uh, in a famous discussion of hate speech, describes hate speech as a kind of... Um, attack on an individual. It's an attack on an individual which says that, let's see if I have the actual quotation from her here. Its message is of racial inferiority, it's directed against a historically oppressed group, and it's persecutory, hateful, and degrading. So this is a different picture where hate speech is used, um, directed against the target of the hatred. So it can, obviously, the very same piece of hate speech, including my earlier example of Der Giftpilz, could be used in either way. You could use it as an attack on an individual, or you could use it as um, a piece of propaganda. What 
does hate speech do with words? I want to suggest that what it does with words depends on its authority. And I want to say not just with words, but also with pictures. Um, what it does is not just the expression of an idea, and it's certainly not just uh, when it's bad, it's bad not in virtue of being offensive. I was asked to speak at a Cambridge Union debate um, a year or so ago on the topic of hate speech, um, and uh, actually the topic was, this house defends um, an unconditional right to offend. Um, and I was given the option of speaking on either side of the proposition, and I decided to speak in favor of the proposition that there should be an unconditional right to offend. And then I proceeded to explain why hate speech should not be defended, uh, because it was not about offense. Anyway, so, I'm, I, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if they got what they were hoping for. Uh, I've talked about uh, what hate speech is, I haven't said enough about what hate speech does, whether or not it's assaultive, and whether or not it's propaganda. I've said I'm going to argue that it's not about offense. It's not about feelings at all. Uh, it's not about the feelings of the speaker being hate hateful. It's not about the feelings of the hearer feeling offended. It's about what the words are doing to people. And those words can do much more to people when they have authority. To consider this, think about the paradigm case of authoritative speech. A paradigm case would be the law. So for instance, consider a bad law. Consider apartheid law. Suppose that apartheid law says blacks are not permitted to vote. That sentence means something very different when it's said in the mouth of a legislator to what it means when it's said in the mouth of a reporter or somebody visiting the country. In one case, in the latter case, it's describing a situation. In the other case, it is enacting a law. And when it's enacting the law, it's also enacting the civil status of black people in South Africa. What does that mean? It's enacting the civil status? It's, it might be offensive, but its offensiveness is not the point. It's making the, someone count as inferior. It is ranking them as inferior. It's uh, legitimating discrimination against them. It's depriving them of powers and rights. All of those things are what a, um, a racist law does to people, to human beings, in virtue of its authority. I want to suggest that in the case of a law like that, uh, the speaker is exercising a kind of practical authority. In the case of propaganda, the Nazi propaganda that I was, ta that I was talking about beforehand, uh, the speaker is exercising a kind of epistemic authority. By practical authority, I mean the kind of authority you have, for instance, when you're a parent and you say, um, uh, successfully or not, uh, lights out by 10 o'clock. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I say, speaking as a parent, okay. <laughs> um, certainly, um, okay, I, I'm not gonna get into digressions about the uh, inadequacies of parental authority, okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, but the, the case uh, of epistemic authority is a case uh, where someone says something and it has authority because it's credible. Or, um, because it's perceived to be ex expert expertise, something like that. So there's a distinction between practical and epistemic authority, and hate speech can have either, I shall argue. So uh, when it has practical authority, it works like uh, the law. It says, um, this sort of person counts as inferior, it's legitimate to treat them a certain way as inferior, and um, and it deprives those people of certain powers. When it works as epistemic authority, it can do that as well, but in a more complicated way. Now, I've got to keep an eye on the time because I know that I've just got um, a few more minutes. All right. I'm going to ask, where does authority come from? Clearly, in some cases, it comes from structures and institutions. In other cases, it comes from something much more informal. For instance, Suppose someone um, hurls 
racist abuse at someone else on a train. This was a situation uh, that, happened in, that happens in real life every now and then. Some people know that it happened in Portland with uh, drastic consequences uh, last year. Um, I wonder what authority, if any, the racist abuser has. You might think none at all. So a friend of mine was on a train in Boston and witnessed um, somebody saying to a Muslim woman, uh, fucking terrorist, we don't want your kind here, get out. Something like this. You might think if anything lacks authority, it's that. But suppose the bystanders on the Suppose the passengers, the hearers, and the bystanders on the train don't do anything. Then the hate speech gets an authority it would otherwise lack. In other words, sometimes authority can, gain, can be gained not by a big institution that gives a big stamp saying, yes, this is the authorized voice of the law, or yes, this is the authorized voice of the Nazi party. Sometimes it comes much more informally through what people around do or don't do. So by our omissions as well as by our actions. So this leads me to the last question. What can be done about hate speech? So if hate speech is, um, okay, there are many, I'm not going to I'm not going to summarize what hate speech always has to be. I'm arguing that it's not about offense. I'm arguing that it's not about the expression of ideas. It's about making people count socially as inferior, about legitimating discrimination against them, and about depriving them of powers and rights, and how this sometimes functions as a get out, as an imperative to get out. Saying get out, like a whites only sign, is not, an expression, is not a manifestation of free speech. Uh, that kind of speech wouldn't be protected if it were, if it were uttered in the context of, dis of segregation law. And when speech is functioning like that, it's not functioning as the expression of ideas that should be protected. I'm all in favor of the freedom of the expression of ideas. And also, as I said, I'm all in favor of an unconditional right to offend. It's not about offense. We're not talking about offense. So, um, in the cases where hate speech gets authority, it can do much more. Um, if it doesn't have authority, it's not going to be ranking people as inferior. The comparison with the law would be ludicrous. But if it can get authority in informal ways, by being credited authority by its hearers, and being allowed to gain authority by, its passive, um, by passive bystanders who don't intervene, then that enables it to do much more than it would otherwise do. This points to a route to some different solutions. One solution is to understand that if the authority is gained from institutions, institutions can be part of the solution. So um, Catherine Gelber, who is a political scientist here in uh, Brisbane, in uh, UQ, um, says uh, that free speech involves a capacity to speak, and this might involve uh, having resources to answer bad speech. Now, this is something that institutions can help with by providing opportunities for targeted groups to answer hate speech. So that, if it would be pursued, would be an, an option that is not about censorship at all. It's about providing opportunities for more speech more counter-speech. The other thing that can be done is, can, is something that can be done by everyone, not by institutions, but by individuals. Wherever hate speech is, it draws its force, it draws its authority from what we don't do as well as from what we do. So that means it's in the power of anyone who hears it or anyone who sees it to intervene and stop it. This might not mean calling it out. It might mean uh, making a joke about it. It might mean diminishing it. It might mean um, 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 making eye contact with the target so that the person doesn't say, think, oh, this is what everybody is taking for granted. So there is a power in the hands of ordinary people to take to draw the teeth of hate speech by depriving it of authority. 
That doesn't mean it's easy. It's very, very difficult sometimes. It can be heroic at other times. At other times, it can be mundane. But I am out of time. And there is so much more I want to say about this. But fortunately, we're going to have a chance to talk about this and lots of other things uh, in just a moment. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Um, and I'll stop. <laughs>